for your words and your direction this morning. Uh, it is wonderful to be here, and let me just start by thanking so many of you in this room and many, many more outside of this room who were so instrumental in getting us to the Paris Agreement. Uh, honestly, without your help, it would have been completely impossible. And of course, uh, my deep gratitude to the nothing but magnificent Laudato Si that helped to draw the art of solidarity across the political sky, allowing governments to adopt the Paris Agreement in 2015. So thank you for all of you too for your participation in that. Um, the Cardinal has uh, pointed out quite clearly a dilemma that we find ourselves in. And that dilemma is, yes, absolutely, the transition of the global economy must be an orderly transition. It must be smooth, it must be a just transition. Absolutely true. And at the same time, if there is one thing that is included in Laudato Si, and that is not included in the Paris Agreement is the sense of urgency on climate action. And it was not included in the Paris Agreement because had we had it there, we would not have been able to adopt the Paris Agreement in a unanimous fashion the way that we did. The urgency that is in Laudato Si but is not in the Paris Agreement has to be put very, very starkly into numbers. And what it actually means is that we have to bend the curve of emissions by 2020. That is four years from now. That is an urgent call. So I would like to address three questions about that urgent call. Is it necessary? Is it desirable? And is it achievable? To the first, is it necessary? Well, you tell me. If we do not bend the emissions by 2020, we're going to move from a displaced population of 60 million, which is what we have right now, the highest international and national displacement of humans that we have ever seen in the history of our society. 60 million, highest point. We will move very, very quickly to 100, 200, or maybe even 300 people displaced, either within their own territory or outside causing a humanitarian crisis that is going to be difficult, if not impossible, to manage. Secondly, if we do not bend the curve of emissions by 2020, we're going to be condemning the one billion people who today are still in extreme poverty, and that should not be acceptable to any of us, one billion people in extreme poverty, we will condemn them to perpetual extreme poverty. Why? because the impacts of climate change are going to grow exponentially, both in intensity and in frequency. And developing countries where most of the extreme population is, extremely poor uh, population are, they will be having to invest very, very scarce resources into rebuilding, rebuilding, and rebuilding very, very basic infrastructure. So they will never have any resources left for health, for housing, for all of the basic, for food security, for all of the basic human rights that we all aspire to. So is it necessary? Well, it is necessary if we know that we are committed to solving extreme poverty. To my second question, is it desirable? Well. Fortunately, the answer to that is absolutely desirable. Not only would we avert the worst impacts of climate, two of which I have mentioned, but we would actually, through the investment into renewable energy for the first time, because of the characteristics of renewable energy, we would be able to give access to energy to 1.3 billion people around the world, most of whom are in extreme poverty. We would be able to improve the health of many of those people, certainly those living in urban, uh, in urban areas and in cities. Take a look at what is happening in many of the Asian cities. We would be able to increase food security because we would be restoring lands and we would be able to create many, many new jobs. And we know that that is also uh, very, very urgent. And we would be able to, if we do this right, to support the transition of jobs of those who would lose a certain kind of job and have to be retrained and move into new jobs. 
So it is necessary, it is desirable. Now the question, is it achievable? Well, there's a fantastic word <coughs> in German that doesn't exist in Spanish, being my mother tongue, or in Italian, uh, which is ja, which means both yes and no. Uh, and uh, I, I think the word should exist in every language, particularly we Latin Americans love to say yes and no to every question. <laughs> I think Italians do too. So um, is it achievable? Yes and no. Let me start with the no. What are the concerns about achieving this? Well, let me just point out two. The first is that temperatures continue to rise. Last year was the hottest year in the whole history of recorded temperatures. The year before that had been the last, and so on and so forth. So we are on an incredible curve of temperature increase. The second concern that uh, we all share about being able to achieve this is the very, very unfortunate politicization of climate change. Honestly, climate change is actually a moral issue, it's an environmental issue. It is not, should not be a political issue, but has been very, very sadly politicized. Those are at least two things that are working in our disfavor. Now, where do I get hope? Because I am a very stubborn optimist. Where do I get my hope that actually we will be able to achieve this? Number one, actually, we are now three years in a row in which the concentration of greenhouse gases has actually been flat. We are not emitting more. Uh, and we are growing in, uh, in GDP, in particular in developing countries, which is where growth must occur. So actually, pretty good there. Maybe we're beginning to decouple greenhouse gases from the GDP. Secondly, the cost of renewable energy has come down 80% since 2008, making renewable energy very, very cost effective and in fact competitive with fossil fuels in many different jurisdictions. Third, technology is advancing at unbelievable pace in the renewable energy, not so in the fossil fuel energy side, because that is the new sector that is very new industry and engineering challenge that most of our young people want to work in, and they are putting their fantastic brains to that. Uh, and we're beginning to see the heyday of, uh, of BP, and may I just uh, use yesterday, uh, the chief economist of British Petroleum came out and said in the Financial Times, no, no, no less, he began, he said that he realizes that there are at least two times as much fossil fuel reserves in uh, in waiting than those that can be used. That is already the beginning of an admission on the part of the fossil fuel industry that they too must move. It's not that they are going to die as an industry if they move forward. They can transition and become energy companies much, much beyond fossil fuel companies. And finally, and perhaps most importantly for today's discussion, the moral responsibility that we all share. And it is that moral responsibility that I think leads us to turn the question of, is it achievable, to a much, much more important question, which is how are we going to ensure that it is achieved? How are we going to ensure that we bend the curve of emissions before it is too late for the most vulnerable populations on this planet? How are we going to ensure that? By aligning our moral compass with our financial decisions. Let me be very clear. It's very difficult to know that asbestos kills and still be the owner of asbestos factory. Those two things do not align. And the same for fossil fuel, in particular, coal. So how do we ensure that we, are, uh, that we are going to achieve the bend in uh, emissions by shifting our capital, by shifting from burning fossil fuels, those companies that are burning, to all of the different opportunities of investing in renewable energy for all. By truly understanding that although every investment portfolio is unique, and I do not have visibility into any of the, vis uh, any of the investment portfolios, the fact is that if you begin to scratch and do the numbers, on average, and your portfolios may be a little bit different, but on average, there's not more than three to five percent of every portfolio that is actually invested in high carbon fossil fuels. Frankly, the risk is rather low. And the impact is huge. Shifting that capital can have a huge impact, and the risk is low. 
So when you compare benefit and cost, I think the benefit comes out way ahead of the game. How do we ensure that we can achieve bending the emissions by 2020? By signaling with our financial decisions that we do understand the urgency of action, by signaling that we're not willing to have this topic be politicized, because we are going to be guided by our moral compass. You know, we wake up these days, and every morning, the news has wants us to believe that we're in the middle of an impossible storm. Well, I suggest that we keep to our steadfastness, and that we do not allow ourselves to be battered down or blown off course. I suggest that we all come together to ensure that we achieve the bending of emissions. That we work together and act together and decide together in order to show that the arc of compassion is not broken, that the arc of solidarity is not broken, that the arc of love is not broken. Because as humanity faces the greatest challenge of the 21st century, we have to courageously answer our own moral call. I'm often asked, what keeps me awake at night? Well, I tell you, I have a recurrent dream that there are seven little eyes, little pairs of eyes. They're always little eyes, and they're always very, very black. And I have come to understand that they are seven generations ahead of us. And the seven little pairs of eyes always ask me, what did you do? What did you do? Now, I suggest to you that that is not a question only to me. It is a question to every single adult alive today. What did you do? And I invite all of us to act and decide such that we may be able to answer those seven little pairs of eyes by saying we collectively did not what we thought was possible, but what we knew was necessary. For there is a difference between those two things, and in that difference lies the fate of the most vulnerable of this planet.